Well, good morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you are in the world. Hello, thanks for joining me today for our National Aardvark Day celebration. Okay, so uh, I'm Christine Elder. I'm your host today. I'm a naturalist, environmental educator, and visual artist. Hi, Cindy. Thanks for joining us today. Yes, and Deb from Arizona. And yes, Cindy from New Hampshire. So um, this is how we roll. Uh, the resources are down below where it says download aardvark image here. And so that's this uh, sketching cheat sheet. But don't worry if you don't have it. Um, you can always just follow along uh, with a pencil and paper. Okay, so this is our plan. Uh, let me make this larger. You don't have to see me anymore. So yeah, today's focus is on aardvarks <laughs> because it's National Aardvark Day. So we're going to talk a bit about their anatomy. Well, mostly about their anatomy, actually, because that's how you learn to draw something more accurately is to really understand um, how they're built from the inside out. And then we're going to do our live sketching practice, like I mentioned, and then we'll do the step-by-step -step, uh, silhouette. And then I'll show you kind of a speedy demonstration of the shading, because a lot of you guys have done shading with me already. <laughs> and um, yeah. Oh, hello, Rhea from Amsterdam and Jacqueline from San Jose. Thanks for joining us. All righty. And so um, don't worry if you don't have any sketching materials or you don't have the cheat sheet. Um, it's okay. You can learn a lot today. Um, and you can always watch the replay and follow along. But if you want to follow along today, all you need really is a basic graphite sketching pencil. But um, I am going to uh, demonstrate my... Um, my shaded pencil uh, technique using some of these tools many of you may may know before. So anyway, don't worry if you don't have those, just have a sketching pencil and a piece of paper. And then this um, cheat sheet is the one that's available at the link below where it says download aardvark image here. Okie dokie. And so here's an example of kind of the finished version. Um, it all, I was also using this viewfinder here and the value scale, which I explained those about those more in my courses. And I know many of you who said hi in the chat box, um, already have those, but those are always really helpful for you, uh, in terms of, um, um, uh, evaluating values. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Um, oh, hi, Antonia. Your first workshop from Rhode Island. Wow, I've never been there before. Cool. So yeah, anyway, um, here's just a cute couple examples I did. This is the shaded graphite um, version. And then this is a colored pencil version. I love using, um, what do you call them? Very thin um, pencils, uh, Prismacolor Very Thins, which are good for sketching in the field. And, you know, these are pretty quick sketches. The idea of um, like you'd be sketching in the field. Okay. So let's start talking about our featured creature. Again, today is National Aardvark Day. Now you probably don't have any aardvarks native to your nation, but there are a lot of nations in Africa that have them. So anyway, it's, it's, it's um, National Aardvark Day. And they are super unique. They're kind of known as a living fossil because um, they look very similar and haven't evolved much um, since they came um, around millions of years ago. And uh, they have been around for quite a long time. Um, they haven't changed much since they first evolved in the Miocene and the early Pleistocene. Uh, there used to be a lot more species in this group, and now there's only one left. And the others were extinct um, thousands or millions of years ago. And so they're actually um, not closely related to anything else. Um, they're in their own order, the tubula dentata, and we'll talk a bit about what tubula and dentata means in uh, Latin later, and then they're in their own family as well. Uh, so, um, yeah, and then there's just the one species. Okay, let's see, what was I going to say about that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, well, let me mention that as long as we have that up here, because uh, I'm not going to have this word again. Tube means like tubular and dent as in dentition. And it refers to these um, tube-shaped microstructures in their teeth. 
They don't lose use their teeth a whole bunch because they're eating soft food, but they do have these very unique tube-like um, teeth, which um, if you saw them, you would recognize the skull. Um, it's unique of any other mammal skull in the world. And their family name, <laughs> let's see, let me look that up. I forget. Um, oh yeah. Um, it means minor plus foot plus Africa. So afar means um, relates to Africa and um, uh, opus means foot and oryctris means uh, actually like miner. So um, that's because they are mining or digging with their very strong front limbs to get their food. Okay. And so, yeah, they're not closely related to anything else. They're distantly related to um, manatees and elephants, <laughs> which is interesting. Okay, so where do they live? We talked about how their um, specific epithet name refers to Africa. So here's where they live. They basically are found throughout sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so this is the Sahara up here, the desert, and they're all down here. Um, so not really very numerous, but they are widespread. And so they can be in a lot of different habitats, um, savannas, grasslands, woodlands, bushlands, and, and the veld, as they call it in Africa. So um, here's a, a picture here. So pretty, pretty wide ranging um, in most countries. They're very adaptable to a wide range of habitats um, as long as it has a couple characteristics. One is it has to have some sandy soil that's um, not too compacted so that they can dig. They dig for their food and they dig for their um, sleeping arrangements, which we'll talk about later. So as long as they have um, that ability um, to have the food and have their burrows um, and it's not too compacted, they can live just about uh, anywhere. Um, and um, so they're not found in ground that's too rocky and generally not in mountainous areas that lack their um, foodstuffs. Uh, they do kind of like flooded um, areas or, or seasonally flooded areas that um, have a lot of cool topsoil that's easy for them to dig into that's loose and sandy. So they're found in a lot of the um, national parks throughout Africa. They're found in the Serengeti in, in Tanzania, the Maasai Mara Nature Reserve in Kenya. And um, I was reading up that they're actually in about 30 uh, or so parks in Africa. So if you're lucky enough to go anywhere in Africa that most tourists go, you might be able to be in their habitat, but you're probably not going to see them. And so that's one reason it's kind of hard to count them and know um, where they are because they're not only nocturnal, but they're really secretive and shy. So it's kind of hard to see them, but we will um, look at some videos uh, in a moment of some. Okay. Um, yeah. And they're, let's see, what was I going to say? Oh, so moving on to their lifestyles and behaviors. So yeah, speaking of where they live and their behavior, they have a pretty large home range because they eat uh, termites and ants and they can eat about 50,000 of them per night, or they need about 50,000 of them. And so um, they need a pretty wide um, habitat so that they can find all those guys. Um, so they really forage quite widely. Um, each night they come out of their burrow. Like I said, they're nocturnal and they're going to make a big loop around their habitat um, so that they can periodically return to termite mounds that they've already excavated, you know, to allow them to, to rebuild their numbers. Uh, they can move uh, around one to up to 15 miles a night. So they range widely, you know, depending on their prey availability. Okay. Um, and so, like I said, you know, it's kind of really hard to um, estimate all these things because they're shy and nocturnal and they're not very much often seen on uh, in African savanna or on game drives. Uh, let's see, where was I? Yeah, here's a picture of them uh, digging. Well, this is a, a piece of artwork. Yeah, Jacqueline says they remind you of an anteater. And we'll mention that in a little bit. Mention a little bit more about that. 
Um, they were first um, discovered and brought into captivity in 1869. That was the first time they were in a zoo and they were brought all the way to London from one that was captured in South Africa. Um, and they're in actually many zoos in the United States, like the San Diego Zoo, Cincinnati, um, even one in Tacoma, Washington, near where I live, Omaha, Nebraska, Detroit, Minnesota, Memphis, Tennessee. So you have a good chance of seeing one in a zoo near you. Um, and so, yeah, here's just a really fun um, um, uh, piece of uh, digital artwork of one digging up, digging, digging, digging those termite mounds. So yeah, here is their, um, the other reason they dig is to make these, uh, excavate their dens. Okay. Um, oh, so I'm kind of lost. I have so many pages here of notes because they're so fascinating. Oh yeah. So, um, so yeah, we'll, we'll see some examples of um, their, their limbs and their skeleton in a moment so you can understand just how strong they are. But they dig multiple mounds in these nest um, dens throughout this very large home range they have. Like I said, they can range up to 15 miles. And you don't want to be 15 miles away from your home when a, um, you know, a leopard comes uh, searching for you. So throughout their home range, they have many, many dens. They may maintain several of them in their home range. Um, so they'll have a main one that's up to 40 feet long um, and like 10 feet deep. Um, and it will have multiple entrances so they can uh, exit and enter uh, when they need to. And they, um, and they can cover up those entrances for safety. Uh, so these are sort of like safe houses, right, throughout their range to quickly escape lions uh, and other predators. Uh, and also the females will have a very large den for nesting with their babies. OK, um, so they also um, will burrow uh, just a second type of den that's kind of small, just a safe house to get away from predators that's not as deep. Uh, and they can even um, burrow into termite mounds to escape predators. <laughs> uh, so, um, so yeah, they're really uh, important ecosystem engineers and what we call a keystone species because they are making this big den that when they're not around can be used by a lot of other animals. Um, just like you may have taken my uh, workshop on woodpeckers um, a few weeks ago, and we talk about how they can excavate um, nest cavities in trees. And then that nest cavity can be used by up to 30 different species of birds and mammals that use those cavities. Well, the same thing with these guys. So when they're not around, uh, there can even be other species, including their predators, that might um, take refuge in there, like hyenas and also warthogs. You may have um, joined me for my warthog workshop a couple weeks ago. They live in these kind of dens, and they're not quite as good at burrowing as these guys. Uh, jackals, even owls, even snakes, ground squirrels, hedgehogs, hares, porcupines. So yeah, they're really keystone species in being able to make these um, holes in the ground. And uh, there's one digging. Okay, so what do they eat? What is their prey and their diet? And Mary Ellen had asked, is a termite an ant? Because their main diet is termites and ants. And no, they're um, related, uh, but there are many, many species of both of them. Now, termites um, are unique in making these big uh, mounds. And in Africa, these things can be up to something like eight feet high. <laughs> um, and um, termites uh, you know, live in these mounds. And that's what the uh, aardvark will dig into. Uh, but they also like several species of ants as well. And um, the aardvark will um, not only eat termites that are inside their uh, mound, but they'll also eat ants, uh, especially when they're uh, moving um, through the bush. They'll be crawling around at night um, along trails to go um, do their own hunting. <laughs> like when I was in Belize last month, I got to watch uh, army ants on the move. And that was amazing. But anyway, so termites and ants are closely related. There's many species of each, and uh, but they're about the same, you know, size and 
Um, they probably taste really different, but uh, you can see they've got this nice squishy body that's easy to eat. <laughs> so um, yeah, they do have several favorite species of, of ants and termites, but I can't pronounce those. You probably wouldn't know what they are anyway. Um, but you know, like we said before, they're insectivores, you could call them, or um, a fancy name for um, that is myrmecophagus, meaning of specializing in eating ants. And like we said, there are a lot of other things that eat ants and termites, like ant eaters, um, that we'll focus on in a couple months. I think next month I'm doing the ant eater family of South America. Aardvarks, uh, ard wolves, even. <laughs> um, armadillos, echidnas, numbats, pangolins, and even sloth bears. <laughs> So um, now 90% of what they eat are those ants and termites, but there's another really special plant that I learned about that they eat. It's called the aardvark cucumber. <laughs> and this is the only photo I could um, find of it. You can see they, um, they have kind of these like tubers and then this trailing part. Um, and they are members of the um, cucumber family. And then you see um, this little butterfly here and this little hole excavated. Well, what is that? Well, it's called the aardvark cucumber because um, it's basically the aardvark is the only animal that eats it. And the um, aardvark is also the only animal that can help distribute it. So a lot of plants have a symbiotic relationship with animals in terms of needing to have their flowers pollinated or their fruits eaten um, in order to disperse them. And that's one reason um, the fruits um, are so tasty and sweet, right? That's why we eat them. But when an animal eats a fruit, those seeds inside the fruit get um, moved through the digestive tract and then defecated, usually in a different spot. And then that helps the plant to uh, uh, spread its, um, its gene pool around because a plant, unlike an animal, can't just walk um, across its African savanna habitat and plant itself in a new location. So the weird thing about these is the, art, the aardvark cucumber um, uh, flowers underground and it requires flowers and fruits underground. So it requires the aardvark to dig it up. And these guys can be, um, I think, like a foot underground. And so they have to dig them up, then they eat the fruit, and then they will um, walk someplace else and eventually digest that fruit and it will come out their scat. And then they actually bury, burrow, burrow, bury their scat. I can't say that word. You know, just like a dog will try to um, bury its scat. So that will help to plant the aardvark cucumber. Isn't that amazing? So no other animal is known to dig up and eat this um, and um, and it's the only plant eaten by an aardvark. So it very much is a symbiotic, uh, what we call a, um, um, a commensal relationship. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So like I said before, I think they can eat up to 50,000 ants or termites a night. Um, and they can visit up to 30 termite burrows. And again, that's why they need such a wide, um, um, home range, but they also like to eat this, um, aardvark cucumber. And it, um, it also probably gives them some, um, um, nutritional value as well as a water source because fruit, you know, as you know, uh, is generally um, is generally pretty uh, squishy and liquidy. So it gives them some, some water source. Uh, anyway, let's keep going. Okay, so who are their predators? You saw a couple predators in those videos. So one of them uh, is hyenas. Another is the uh, African lion. Uh, also cheetahs, uh, wild dogs, and even some snakes like pythons can eat them. Okay, so what are some of the threats? Now, it's kind of, um, since they are so shy and nocturnal, it's kind of hard to tell what their threats are. You don't normally see them, you know, uh, dead <laughs> or eaten. But um, they do get hit on roads. 
Um, they are uh, um, moved out of um, agricultural regions, of course, because that's the same kind of region um, with the soft uh, soil that's easy to dig into that aardvarks like to live in. So their habitat is converted to um, farms um, and also farmers persecute them because they don't want an aardvark in their um, crops, uh, digging them up for their homes. So they will be killed. And then um, sometimes they are eaten as bush meat. Um, so here's some pictures, some sad pictures of pangolins and armadillos being uh, eaten. So lots of animals can um, um, be uh, hunted as bush meat by uh, people that don't have any other sources of food. So again, we did mention them as keystone species and ecosystem engineers. And so, um, you know, if they get uh, taken out of a certain habitat, then that's really bad for all the other animals that um, need them, um, like we mentioned uh, previously and in the video. So hyenas, warthogs, jackals, owls, snakes, squirrels, hedgehogs, hares, porcupines, owls, and snakes all depend on them for making uh, their homes that they can live in when they're not around. Okay, and then we mentioned convergent evolution among other myrmecophages or anteaters. So we talked about a bit um, about their shape is, is um, very similar, um, kind of this, um, this half circle kind of shape with a long snout um, and a long tongue. And that they, um, you know, they have a sticky tongue and it's very long to be able to get into those ant termite nests. Generally, um, all the anteater type animals have pretty small eyes. Now, this is the um, South American anteater we'll be drawing next month. Uh, and this is a pangolin. And both of these have very small ears. So it's interesting that you know, convergent evolution doesn't make all animals that have the same lifestyle look exactly alike, but some of the most important parts are the same that relate to how they eat. And um, there's a couple other animals that also eat ants that um, live uh, in the same habitats. This is an ard wolf that kind of looks halfway between a cat and a dog. And um, they eat almost exclusively ants. <laughs> you wouldn't think so, uh, but look at their tiny mouth. So they're not out there um, eating a lot of other rodents and such. They specialize in eating ants, just like the aardvark. Um, and so is the honey badger likes ants. And these guys will follow them around. Um, they'll follow the aardvark around once the aardvark has uh, eaten um, into a, a termite or an ant nest, um, and they'll get some of the leftovers. Isn't that funny? Okay. Um, yeah, I forgot what I was saying about this. Uh, anyway, moving on. Uh, here's one in a zoo. <laughs> yeah, so you see those huge ears. Okay, so let's um, talk a little bit about the anatomy and then we'll move on to sketching them. So if you've taken many workshops of mine before, especially mammal workshops, I really love to show you the skeleton. So you'll really understand um, what's underneath because the more you understand um, the skeleton and all of the angles that the skeleton makes, the easier it is for you to draw it. In fact, sometimes, um, I have my students look at a skeleton like that, this, and then just draw the animal on top of it. Um, the outlines or silhouette of the animal, and that helps you really understand it. So here, um, starting with the head, you see they have this really uh, long snout and this kind of long um, back of the head. And it's really interesting that their brain case is really unique and enlarged shape. Um, to be able to have um, a lot of area dedicated to the olfactory senses. They have the largest, um, what do you call them, olfactory lobes of any um, other mammal. Um, and they have the most, they have a, a long snout with the most uh, turbinate bones of any mammal. Uh, and those, um, those bones inside their um, 
their snout are covered by this moist epithelium so that they can have a lot of surface area with lots of these um, neurons that can sense smell to help them smell um, their ants. Because most of the time the ants and termites are underground and they can't see them as well as they can smell them. Um, oh, oh, I was going to show you something. Let me see. Where is that? Oh, just a second. Look at the skeleton a minute. Notice these angles while I find something for you. Okay, there. I found it. I'll show you in a second. So, um, okay, and then when you're looking at the skeleton, you also notice this very distinct arched back. So um, that's very different from like, you know, a, a horse or a um, rhino or something. It's always arched like that. It's very distinct. And then they have this very long tail and there's a lot of muscles in that tail to help kind of give them, um, prop them up. So while they're digging, just like when a woodpecker is propped against a tree and they're pecking into a cavity. So really long, strong tail and then um, their limbs. And you can't really tell from this picture, um, but they have four limbs, um, four claws on the front and five on the back. And the front ones are a lot different. You see how much longer that claw is in front? Um, it's big and shovel shaped compared to the ones in back, which are kind of more normal, like other um, mammals that live on the ground and walk around. Uh, I don't know, like a, um, a, a raccoon, right? So look at those long, strong limbs, um, claws. Uh, so they are using those front ones a lot more than the back ones to be digging. And then uh, notice the angle. So when you're drawing the one we're going to draw in a minute, you can see like here's the shoulder angle right here. Here is the uh, ankle actually, and it's elongated foot. Okay. And then back here, we have the, um, the knee. You'll be able to see the knee when we're drawing from the still photo and the ankle up here, okay? The ankle um, and the sort of back of the wrist is up off of the ground. It's not flat like how a we walk or how a bear walks. So they're up off the ground, okay? All right, oh yeah, and then I was gonna show you this. So this uh, is a um, some kind of deer without its antlers. And look closely. I say, if you're looking at the snout, see how much shorter the snout is on this deer than it is on uh, the aardvark. But then when you look inside, look at all these round things inside. So this is the this is the nose where you'll have the uh, nostrils, and you see all those white things in there that kind of go in circles. So those are called turbinate bones. And so the aardvark has a lot more of those than any other mammal. And each one of those is surrounded by this moist epithelium or skin, which is very uh, good at sensing um, the insects. And it has more of these and it's more sensitive than any other mammal. Can you see that? Tell me in the chat box if you can see those kind of circular things inside the nostril. Again, it's not going to have as, the aardvark has a lot more than these, and this is a very old skeleton. So some of these are very delicate and they've broken a long time ago. So you don't see as many, but that's my best skull. I love collecting skulls. Okay. Let me see. Let me go back to, we're going to get, we're going to get closer to sketching here in just a second. Okay. Good. Great. Thanks, Alice and Marina. Thank you. I really love it when you guys participate in the chat box because it gets kind of lonely just talking to myself here uh, at the, um, the, uh, in the microphone in the video. <laughs> Great. Okay. And then, so here's a picture of them sort of standing up and they generally don't do that too much, but you can see how um, they are using their tail as a prop. And in this case, when they're standing up, their ankle here is on the ground. 
But anyway, this was just a really good side view that I was able to find. And I really encourage you, if you want to learn how to draw animals, um, go to zoos and natural history museums where you can see mounted skeletons. And you can see those um, sometimes along with a photograph or even along with the um, real animal in a different part of the um the, the facility, right? So that you can sketch them and really understand those angles, okay? Okay, and like I said, um, here's um, the critter we're sketching today. And I've, I've, I've flipped this, um, this image from um, a couple slides ago, so you can kind of compare a little bit, compare some of those angles. It's at a slightly um, this guy is facing us a little bit more than this one is, but you can still see that long snout and then the arched back, right? You can still see the angles of the uh, elbow right here, which is up here. Um, the knee, which is uh, kind of hidden in most mammals, but it's right there. And uh, the ankle back here. Sorry, this was at the wrist. I had said ankle, I think. This is the wrist. This is the ankle, okay? All right. Okay, so, and then here's just a close-up of one sleeping where you can see um, the hairs in its snout. So those are what's keeping the dirt out. And then they have really long hairs around their eyes, and that also probably um, protects them a bit from the... Um, from the uh, dirt. And then you see the really long um, four toes with a really long shovel shaped claws that are very different from the back ones. And this is just another really sweet photo. Um, this just shows more clearly their anatomy, those big rabbit like ears and the um, pig like snout. And then it shows, um, shows also the coloration so generally they're kind of a sandy color. Um, their, their skin is pretty sparsely covered in this kind of coarse fur, um, but it's a very thick skin to protect them from the insects. Uh, but the fur gets a lot darker, almost black on the limbs, okay? Yeah, Mary Ellen says, nice claws. Yeah, really noticing how much bigger those are. Now uh, we're going to start sketching our, our, our aardvark now. Yeah. And so um, I have some general hints. Now, again, if you're a member of my courses, um, you can get a lot more uh, general sketching tips in there. Uh, and so just quickly, um, I will be demonstrating this kind of as we go today in our um, I think it's a 20 minute demonstration of sketching the aardvark, but you want to think about the idea of blocking in your basic shapes, um, looking at negative shapes, looking at the angles, looking at alignments of various structures to relative other ones, um, looking at relative proportions and looking at flow lines. Oh yeah, Marina says, that's a very short-nosed aardvark. <laughs> yes. No, this is a California sea lion. I don't make these uh, handouts for uh, every single species I sketch. This is just an example of how you would sketch anything. Okay. And yeah, so where are we? Yeah. So with our aardvark, so noticing those shapes, okay? So, you know, the shape of those giant um, jackrabbit-like ears and the shape of the snout, kind of like a, a warthog, right? Various uh, proportions, again, like the proportion of the size of the ear. That ear is almost as long as the whole head, right? Then noticing angles. So, um, for example, um, the angle, uh, let's see, well, of the ear here, that's like a 90 degree angle to the snout, right? And then alignments, like what things are aligned or parallel to each other. Um, like you might want to draw two ears sticking up parallel to each other, but they're actually at kind of like a, what do you say, like a 45 degree angle. Um, and the legs um, are kind of aligned. They're kind of parallel to each other. At least the forelimbs are parallel. The back limbs are not so much because he's facing towards us. 
Well, I said he, but you can't really tell the male or the female from a picture like this. Males are a bit larger. Uh, and then negative shapes. So the negative shapes are the parts that um, aren't the animal. And so that's why I always try to provide you with a really nice, clear photo with the back of it blocked out. That takes me a while to create that. <laughs> um, but I like to have a white background so you can really easily see the shape of the animal as well as the negative shapes. So here, like there's a nice triangle shape between the, the back um, foot and the tail, that kind of thing. Okay. And then you also want to notice, like I said, what's really unique about this animal are the large ears, the really long snout, the relatively small eyes, although they are larger than say, um, relative to like a pangolin or, um, a South American anteater. Um, and then they have hairs and wrinkles and stuff like hairs coming off from around their eyes and hairs in their nose and whiskers and hairs on their feet. Okay, so who is ready to sketch? We're all ready now. And I know a couple of you are brand new. So what I do is I get out of this, this um, slideshow and then I open, oh, got to close that one. I open the video that I created earlier because it's quite difficult to try to demonstrate drawing and talk at the same time. So this is the point um, that if you don't have any sketching materials, I invite you to still keep watching because I think it's really good um, to see um, the way I sketch. Now, there are lots of methods of sketching. Uh, every artist uh, has their own way. So this is just the way I do it. So anyway, it might help um, you to watch um, through. And you can always skip ahead in the replay to this um, timestamp, which is about an hour in. Um, to, to watch again, if you don't want to follow along now, or if you want to watch again, um, and, and follow along. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so here's our image and I've got a larger one for you here. And then when we get to the head, I'll have a close up to help you, um, see it uh, more clearly. Okay. So I just start kind of showing where I am at the edges of the paper. So he fills up the whole paper from left to right. Then I'm just going to kind of block in, I'm showing that big arched back like we saw in the skeleton. And we're not doing any erasing. We're going super, super light here. We'll do some erasing a little bit later. But we are going fairly quickly as if we're sketching in the field. And we'll go over each of these parts again, but we're just going to get the basics here of the general outline of the shape of the body. This one's walking, so it has his tail up in the air. Then drawing just an angle um, for the, the limbs, and we'll fill those in later. The hip region the back limbs and the back right limb, which is kind of behind the left one. So then I kind of keep going. So I'm always double checking my proportions, my angles, alignments, and then I'll just start firming it up again. So I'll continue to go over this again. So I'm not finishing the head first and then moving into the body. And I'm going to fix things as I go several times and double checking kind of where I am on the paper. And so like I was putting his tail a little bit lower than it was before, not worrying about erasing yet because we're pretending we're kind of in the field sketching live, live animals and our animal can walk away anytime. Noticing where that hip is right there. That's the hip joint right there that's hidden. 
But again, you can imagine that well, what we looked at for quite a while in that museum mounted skeleton. The belly, width of the belly. And that belly line con continues on to the neck and the face. We're going to get the shoulder now. And that edge of the foot. Noticing where it is in comparison to the back feet. And I'm drawing a little bit darker than I'd like you to draw. And we're going to work on the head and the front foot a while here. So I got a close up here. So I am drawing a little bit darker than I'd like you to, so that you can really feel like you don't have to erase yet, that you're just blocking things in and you can do some erasing a bit later. Now we notice the ears and it's left ear. Where is that left ear? And it sh looks shorter than the right ear just because of the angle of the head. We know in real life they're the same length, but this, this, um, this animal's left ear is pointing towards us a little bit, so it's a bit foreshortened. So it's a little bit shorter than the aardvark's right ear, visually. And the inside of the ear is all shaded there. And then the left ear you see is taller. I mean, the aardvark's right ear <laughs> looks taller because it's straight up in the air. It's not angled towards us. Now double checking the length of that snout. So it's got a really long, thin head. A lot different than the warthogs we sketched a few weeks ago. But they still have a kind of a pig-like snout, right? So it's enlarged a little bit. We don't really see the opening to the nostrils too much. He's got kind of an overbite here. So the, the lower um, lip is shorter than the snout, if you notice. Oh, I've got some robins singing outside. It must be spring. I don't know if you can hear that. Width of the neck. Now I'm going to do some erasing because I've got sort of my silhouette. So I'm just going to clean up once. This is just a lot faster way to do this. And it's really actually leads to a more accurate drawing if you can get the whole outline first and then erase the quote unquote mistakes. Um, because if you draw and then erase, draw and erase, draw and erase, you're much more likely to keep drawing the incorrect line that's the wrong proportion. So I like to just get my whole silhouette down first. I am going to freeze this just a moment, see if you can catch up. I do encourage you to just keep that pencil moving, just get some lines down, don't stop to erase, just kind of um, really separate the editing from the creating phase. Sort of like when you are, um, you know, when you're writing and you're brainstorming or green lighting an idea, right? So no idea is bad. You're just going to put them all down on paper and then you start thinking about each one and deciding which is best. And, um, and yeah, and it's kind of like, creative writing. When you're writing, it's better to just get everything out of your brain, do a big brain dump, right? Um, and then once you get that down, then edit. So I really like people to separate the creating phase from the editing phase. Okay. How are we doing? Oh, Antonia. Yes, you're sketching. Good. I'm so glad you've joined us today. You're brand new. Okay, so I've got the close-up of the head. We're going to work a little bit more slowly now on the head, looking at the ears. I'm 
So you see I'm going more slowly and I'm pushing down a little harder on the pencil, adding a little shadowing for those ears, giant rabbit-like ears. Again, that's kind of a convergent evolution because uh, lots of things like jackrabbits have giant tall ears and we'll draw jackrabbits in a few months because uh, they both live in these open grassland habitats where they really need to listen because grasslands can uh, very easily hide uh, a, a coyote or wolf or hyena or mountain lion. Um, and so you have to have really big ears out in the grasslands to hear for your predators. Now putting in his eye, his or her eye. Again, they don't have the best sense of sight compared to smell. We draw an eye and then we can draw the, the wrinkles around the eye for the eyelids. And you notice there's some little hairs sticking out from the upper and lower lids to help protect it from dust and sand. Deborah, thank you. I'm glad you like these step-by-step -step instructions. My right ear could probably be a little taller. Okay, so now we're going to move on. Again, you can watch the replay if you um, want to see that close up later. But we're going to keep going with the back. Again, a very tall arched back, imagining that skeleton, that mounted skeleton we looked at earlier. They always have this big arched back, kind of like a, a cat arching its back at um, a rival, right? They can't really flatten their back. That's the way they're built. And I think it helps them to um, dig. And I'm noticing the back and I want to double check. See, I'm a little off there. So that's why I like to double check my proportions. Yeah, so right here, I'm double checking that proportion and I hadn't, hadn't, didn't arch the back enough. So you notice that I'm, I'm looking at this area. My pencil is pointing right at the, um, the knee joint. Uh, again, in most mammals, the knee is kind of hidden. Um, just like in birds, actually, if you drew a bird with me lately, um, the knee is hidden within the kind of contours of the, the bot, the, um, the, the, the main body here. Right. And so, but that is the knee angle that we're going to want to show. Okay. So anyway, the, the hip back here, um, is a lot bigger with this muscular tail coming off than I originally drew it. So that's why it's always good to keep double checking your proportions going back and forth. See how much fatter he has to be. He or she has to be up there at that muscular tail at the, the back of the pelvis. So no worries. I'm just going to make it a little bit larger. So that's why we want to draw pretty lightly so we're not really, you know, committing to any one particular line too early. And you see there's a really subtle angle here. Imagining again that skeleton. We have our vertebral column with the, the neck and the back vertebrae. And right here is where the hip is. So there's a little dip between where the hip is and then where the, um, the tail begins. So you can kind of indicate that if, if you can. 
So I always suggest when you're going to draw something and you really want to understand how to draw something better to really study the skeleton. And it's really easy to find um, images of, of mounted uh, museum skeletons online, just like I did, um, if you don't have a chance to go to a real uh, natural history museum or zoo or aquarium. Like where I live in Oregon, we have this wonderful uh, place called the High Desert Museum, and they have some nice mounts of um, beavers in various positions because we have a lot of beavers here since we have lots of rivers and lakes. And so I recently was there drawing the beavers and imagining their outline based on their skeleton. And, uh, oh yeah, I did have, I did make a little line there. It's pretty subtle, but right here um, are the shoulder blades. And you, you have see this very subtle highlight of the aardvark's left top of its scapula or shoulder blade right there, which is a slightly different line than the neckline. Okay, anyway, now we're adding this, this front leg the aardvark's front right leg. And just noticing where it comes out, making it kind of thicker there. And if you think to yourself why they have certain kinds of anatomy and verbalize it to yourself, it helps you to draw it more accurately. So if you're thinking about, you know, that they have these really strong forelimbs for digging those 30 foot long dens, and then they have super big, strong front claws that they're using, you know, thinking about those structures while you draw helps you to draw it more accurately. And also it just helps you understand their anatomy and how their anatomy is directly related to their lifestyle, as well as, you know, a combination of that and their evolutionary history. And we'll add some, the long fur on that later on, but we're just trying to get the hard outline, the silhouette first. So I'm double checking where my uh, left foreleg starts and we've got that shoulder. Again, it's hidden, but right here, there's a little bit different um, angle here and a different color between the pink color of the neck and the darker color of the body, starting with the front of the shoulder blade. And again, like a great um, homework assignment would be to go back in this slideshow and look at the side view of this mounted skeleton and then draw the silhouette of this animal on that skeleton. Okay, we're showing um, this one has a really steep angle. Sorry, that play button keeps getting in the way. So since this animal, he's walking and he's pushing off with the left foot. So that's a much sharper angle between um, his the, the elbow coming down to the um, kind of wrist there. He's pushing backwards with this left foot. So it's going to be a sharp angle between the, the kind of wrist area there and the claws right there. Notice that sharp angle compared to the right foot that's moving frontwards. And then you see one of the other claws. Again, you can't really tell from this photo, but they have four claws on the front. They've got five on the back. Those really long, strong front claws can actually also help them from predators. 
Um, they can lash out at a predator, especially if something like a lion is, has turned them upside down, is trying to eviscerate them. They can um, lash out with those really long, strong claws and protect themselves. And they have very strong skin and they can run pretty fast too. So they're not as vulnerable as you would think they'd be. Okay, looking at that area there with the belly, just double checking some of my proportions before I go farther. You see how, you know, I double check those proportions before I firm up the lines. And again, you don't have to draw it this dark because we will be adding the hair. So we don't want that outline to be so dark, but I want you to be able to see my drawing in the video. Now working on this hip area and that knee, again, the knee, you know that that's a knee angle right there. Coming down to the foot and notice how close the back left and the front left foot is. So a small negative shape there. I'm making that a little bit bigger there. I don't know why I did that, but anyway, double checking that you really don't over round that too much because there is a kneecap there and a knee angle. And then there's a pretty sharp angle that I'm fixing right there with the back left toes. One, two, three, four. You can see four of the back left toes, but there technically are five. And you can see those better on the back left foot than you can on the back right foot, which is partially hidden. And then, yeah, one of those toes is kind of separated from the other, you see. Kind of looks a little bit more like a dew claw. So there's some negative white space between those two. But I want you to know that, you know, legs and feet are pretty complicated. And again, if you're join my um, mammal sketching course, I have a whole two hour workshop on the anatomy of uh, limbs forelimbs limbs and back limbs and legs and feet and hooves and claws, whatever you want to call them. Um, so, you know, if something like this is intimidating to you and you feel like you just can't give it, get it right, um, just hide them in a bunch of sand or, or grass. <laughs> no big deal that we're not trying to create an anatomical biological illustration here. We're just having fun. And, you know, if this was a live uh, ant eater that we are lucky enough to sketch, we're not going to be able to see all this stuff. So feel free to just draw a bunch of grass blades in front of your feet if you hate them. Okay. But it is good practice. Like I said, one of my mottos is learning to draw while drawing to learn. And so, you know, we take the time to draw something, even if it doesn't turn out the way we want to, because we, it is helping us to understand that structure even if that understanding isn't necessarily uh, translated to the page as much as you would hope it to be, right? You're still learning a lot more about the angles, about the legs and toes, all that. Okay. So now just firming things up before we move on. One more chance to the, do the whole thing. So going back to the head a bit. So you got your close up of your head and here you can really see some of the hairs coming out of the front of the snout, which um, I kind of forgot to add. I'm adding those now. <laughs> So if you understand the anatomy and you, if you know what's supposed to be there, it's more likely that you'll look for it and you'll add that. I was just changing a little bit here, this angle. 
Oh, this little wart-like thing it seems to have under its eye. Now continuing on to the uh, forelimbs and shoulder. And still just working on the silhouette. We'll add the fur later. Or in a few minutes, we only have a few minutes left here. So this is just giving you a chance again to look. Hmm, Mary Ellen, you said the back legs look very large and the skeleton like they would hop like a kangaroo. Um, yeah, that's a very good uh, observation. And that's what's wonderful about looking at the skeleton is it really helps you even understand more their lifestyle and their movements. And so you can imagine when they are digging out these um, dens, especially the female whose den can be 30 feet deep with lots of different uh, entrances and exits and their ability to, to, to dig so quickly they're going to need strong back limbs and that strong muscular tail to brace themselves against the ground while they're using their forelimbs to do all that digging. Uh, remember, they can dig, what did I say, three feet in five minutes. So that's pretty fast, uh, depending on uh, how hard the soil is, right? <laughs> Um, and it's um, those termite mounds can be just as hard to dig into as the soil. Uh, so yeah, good observation. It's always instructive to look at the, um, the skeleton. <laughs> Millicent Art says, it looks like he's wearing high heel shoes. Yeah, that's right. Cause those are those claws that are kind of pointing backwards as he's walking, or they kind of look like they're pointing backwards. They're more sort of pointing towards us. So they're foreshortened, but yeah, you do see um, some white space or negative shapes between those. Yeah, and the more, the longer you observe something, the more you're going to notice little minute, minute things like this. So I always suggest people, you know, sketch from still photographs like this, and then next move on to sketching from videos. Oh, wait, sorry. Um, sketching from videos before you go out and try sketching at a museum or a zoo. Right. So yeah, a few more minutes to look at this moments to look at this. And then I have a kind of just a speedy couple minute version of how I do the shaded pencil. Again, a lot of you guys have done this with me before and I do it in my courses, so I'm not going to belabor the point. But um, this is just a speedy version of me um, shading the rest of him and then adding the long hairs. So here we go. That's what I'm using. And I'm lightening up the outline because you don't want a hard outline. Really only the, the tips of the ears and the arched back has a really hard outline. The rest of it has fuzziness here and there. So first, I just kind of add some values all over the animal with the side of a pencil. Then I blend it with my blending stomp or a Q-tip. So I'm just trying to get the middle range of values, looking with my value scale, and then starting to add the darks slowly, either with the tip or the side of my pencil. Yeah, Millicent Art, that value scale I made myself and I have downloadable versions of my value scales and viewfinders in my courses. And I talk about more about how to use those and really how to get those full range of values. So we're using the darks and lights not only to indicate the color of the fur 
and the dark color of the eyes, but you know, your lights and darks to also show highlights and shadows. Yes, Deb, I'm glad you like your my value scale. It's very helpful. Millicent said, I used to be on you teach. No, I've only pretty much done my own thing on my website and crowdcast. <laughs> anyway, here I am. Yeah, just adding some more. I'll kind of switch around between the sharp graphite pencil to add some of the thin uh, fur. The fur is longer on the limbs, if you notice, and shorter on the body. So I'm darkening that those darker limbs, as you may remember from the videos. It's kind of more obvious in those videos how black the limbs are, and it's we never know. We never know why. There was a question why. There often are multiple evolutionary reasons why something happens in a body. Why, oops, sorry, here we go. Right, so going back to that question of, um, you know, why something has a certain color, you know, you, you never can answer that question, obviously. Uh, even the reason zebras are striped have multiple different hypotheses that I've shared with you in my zebra sketching tutorial. Um, but usually, you know, an animal, the way they look is a combination of, um, you know, their evolutionary history, their taxonomy, um, their lifestyles, whether they're males or females, how old they are, and just by chance too, you know, like sometimes a, a bird is is born uh, melanistic or, you know, or um, leucistic that's all white and they're usually colored, right? So a lot of reasons for things and we never know the exact reason. <laughs> okay, so now um, is a chance for you to share if you have any questions, if you'd like to come up on screen, I'd love to see your happy faces up on screen. You can either share your um, thumbnail sketches you did during the videos or um, share this sketch you're working on. Obviously, you won't have probably finished it by now, but I'd love to see your progress. So yeah, and it doesn't matter what your sketch looks like. This isn't about the finished product. It's about having fun. Um, learning a little bit about your organism as you draw it, no matter how it turns out. Here's my one in the very thin colored pencils that I did with this tongue stuck out for fun. This one was done using my uh, Prismacolor very thin pencils, which I like because um, they have a thinner lead, so they last longer without sharpening, and I really love those in the field. Okay. So let me see. Um, let me click on Jacqueline. Hi, how you doing? Hi. Hello. I'm uh, so glad you're visiting us today, and also to, to prove that it, it is working on my end. I was a little bit worried. Time. It's a yeah. little finicky sometimes. Um, yes. I hope this shows up because I sketch light and loose, like you always tell us. I do. Well, so, a little bit higher and um, closer. Yeah, that's good. And a little bit to your left. Uh-huh. Yeah. Perfect. Oh, there we go. Oh, that's great job. I love that. <laughs> okay. So you can see it. Yeah. yeah. Did you have fun learning about aardvarks? Yes. Uh, but I do have a question. Okay. A little puzzled because they're the they're a species in itself. And I understand the relation to maybe because of their arch their spinal column i was looking at the skeleton yes. very carefully so um yeah my question is because you mentioned some similarities with the uh pangolin and also the armadillo and that was surprising and i i didn't finish this oh, but here's you. here's my armadillo and this is from last year oh it was yeah that was a that fun was species of armadillo yeah and yeah i loved it i put it aside um i i didn't finish i didn't do the scales yeah but 
but I completed the outline. Yeah. And so I'm showing this because, uh, Christine, I was wondering, because uh, they're um, like anatomically, are they similar? If I never did see the skeleton of the armadillo. But oh, yeah. Look, it is in my slideshow for that. It, would yeah. it be kind of like the aardvark? even though their head is smaller? Um, yes, yes. Um, but um, yeah, they do look a little bit different, but you know, you can still really obviously tell they're a mammal, you know? So, you know, mammals have similar skeletons, just like us, if we were able, if we were to get down on all mm -hmm. fours, we would still have a lot of similarities, except for the shape of our skull and the lack of a okay. tail. <laughs> um, yeah. So, you know, there's there's diversity and unity within any group of animals. And mm -hmm. especially if they have a similar lifestyle, like you mentioned the arched back, a lot of animals like the armadillo and pangolin and aardvark and mm -hmm. anteater, they have this arched back and that just helps them be able mm -hmm. to um, kind of bend over and, and dig better and give them mm -hmm. a bit more... Um, I can't think of the word, but just, uh, um, yeah, I can't think of the word, uh, but better like ergonomics, I'd say, right. As opposed oh, yeah. to an animal, like if you imagine other animals that live on the African savanna, you know, like the, the, oh. the you know, uh, uh, the African or a cheetah, right. So the cheetah is just the opposite. They, they run really fast. So they have a very flat back mm -hmm. and elongated center backs and elongated legs so they can run more quickly. Oh. So, you know, animals are shaped based on their lifestyle. And a lot of their lifestyle has to do with how they get food, right? And of course, whether they're terrestrial or arboreal. Yeah. Oh, okay. Can armadillos, I'm curious, can they run fast too? Um, kind they, of scurry. Yeah, I mean, I've seen them scurrying across, like, yeah, parking lots and stuff. It's kind of funny. They Their long claws make this click-clacking sound, again, yeah. as if they're in high-heeled shoes, like we mentioned earlier. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, mm -hmm. they, they're much more flexible than they look like they would be with that armored cover, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks for joining mm -hmm. us. Bye-bye. Bye. Adagio asks, why do aardvarks burrow into the termites' home and eat the termites? Well, that's their favorite food. <laughs> um, just like woodpeckers burrow into a tree to eat the um, beetle larvae that are um, maturing inside there. So every animal has a favorite thing they eat and it's related to, you know, how they're built. So they're built with this long snout and this really um, good sense of smell to be able to smell the termites and ants and a really long sticky tongue that can um, have the termites stick to them. So lots of animals like, um, well, I mean, lots of mammals uh, like to eat uh, insects and other invertebrates because they're easy to capture. <laughs> they can't run too fast. Um, and they're, um, they multiply very quickly. So they have a very short lifespan. So it's really easy to eat a lot of them and come back a month later and there's a bunch more left, right? So, um, it's a really easy food source and they're built to dig into those burrows with their really strong claws and forelimbs. So they're specialized in that. Not all animals can do that. Like you can imagine, um, something like a hyena, they live in that same habitat, but they don't have the same types of, um, claws to do that. A hyena has a very strong jaw, just about the strongest mammal jaw there is. Um, and so they are really good at, um, you know, capturing other mammals and breaking their necks and eating them that way. But an aardvark has a very tiny mouth like a pangolin or an anteater um, with a long tongue. So that's what they have to eat or ants and termites. They can't eat anything else uh, except that aardvark cucumber that we mentioned. So I hope that helps. <laughs> okay, I got to get going. Take care. Have a wonderful day. Take care of yourselves. Be safe. And uh, yeah, I love you. Bye.